Good morning. Well, today and next Sunday, I'm going to talk about our favorite subject at church, money. You know, in the American religion of materialism, there are two words that are more sacred than any other two words. Charge it. You know, uh, it's amazing how often that takes place every day here in America. And yet I don't think most of us really evaluate the intelligence of using plastic. Let me give you two examples. Ellen is 30 years old. She has a $3,000 and a $500 balance on her Citibank credit card, and the interest rate is 18%. But she makes the minimum payment every month. How old will she be when she finally pays off her credit card, assuming she doesn't make any additional charges? 30-year-old Ellen will be 70 years old when she finally pays off her credit card, making minimum monthly payments. How about Susan and Tom? Susan and Tom, young married couple, they need a new washing machine. So they go down to Home Depot and they find one, a second, that's on sale, believe it or not, for $299. That's unbelievable, isn't it? So they get a Home Depot charge card and they make the minimum payments each month by the time the washing machine is paid for just making minimum payments, how much do you think Susan and Tom will actually pay for that $300 washing machine? Making minimum payments, they will actually pay $1,199 for that $300 washing machine. You know, I hope the statistics are not correct. I hope they're inflated. But um, a very reputable organization that teaches Christian finance estimates that the average Christian, the average church attender, will end up in their lifetime spending 15 to 20 percent of all of their income in interest. And I think about how little they will actually give to the work of the Lord. You know, when people used to be in debt and they were so in debt they couldn't pay, they would literally be arrested and thrown into jail until the debt was paid off. And that was called what? Debtor's prison. Now, debtor's prison was outlawed in the 1800s, early 1800s here in the United States. You know, we don't have debtor's prison, literally, in the U.S. anymore. But we still have <laughs> people that are in debtor's prison emotionally and financially. And most of it revolves around credit card abuse and uh, high interest loan applications. Newsweek magazine Matter of fact, uh, probably a couple years ago, on the cover of their magazine, they, they had this, this picture of just a sea of credit cards, and this couple was literally drowning in a sea of credit cards. And the, the headline of that issue of Newsweek was, Americas are, Americans are drowning in debt. And then it asks the question, are you maxed out? Uh, and that whole article went on to say, and they just keep coming out again just recently, that Americans are still borrowing money in records amount, especially in recent months as the economy has continued to Tank, literally, inflation going up. Bankruptcies are once again on an unbelievable increase at 20%. And most people are spending in America more 
than they make. So this Sunday and next Sunday, we're going to talk about this thing about debt. And we're going to talk about how to get out of debt and how to stay out of debt using God's principles for money management. And by the way, if you have never taken financial peace, or if you've taken financial peace and you could use a refresher, you know, we're going to literally offer financial peace, and we'll talk a little bit more about this at the end of the message, uh, to hopefully see people in our church become financially free. Uh, and if you'll follow the principles, and I've seen so many people in our church do it, when they actually go through financial peace and they actually go through the steps that they take you through and you, and you work the plan, you can be financially free. And one of the amazing things that happens when you're financially free and you're out of debt, it's amazing the freedom you have emotionally, the freedom you have spiritually, and the ability that you have to do what a lot of people would love to do if they could afford it. And that's called give and to be generous. You know, George Gallup reports that 64% of all couples argue over what? Money. You know, conflict over money is listed as the number one cause of divorce. You know, wedding vows for many couples ought to include the statement until debt <laughs> do us part. 64% of married couples argue about money and over 54% of divorces give that as the top cause of divorce. It's also reported that 74% of all people in America are dissatisfied with how they manage their money. That's an unbelievable statistic. You know, this topic may seem like an unspiritual, mundane issue for us to talk about here in church. But actually, this is probably one of the most spiritual things we could talk about. You know, we've, you know, we've done this every year. And, you know, we remind you that the Bible has more to say about money than it does about heaven, than it does about hell, than it does about faith. Matter of fact, money and our relationship to money, it has more to say about that than any other single topic. And the reason why is that it's an issue that impacts all of our lives. It's something that we all have to deal with. It's something that we all should manage. God says, you know, I want you to manage it well. And it's really interesting. Did you realize that God measures our spiritual maturity in how we actually handle money? Did you know that the Bible says God measures and evaluates how much he can trust you with how you handle money? Did you realize that the Bible says that many of the spiritual blessings that you can receive and ought to be receiving in your life revolve around how we handle money? Uh, matter of fact, the Bible also says that many of the rewards in heaven will be ultimately determined by how we have managed the smallest thing that God trusts us with, and that is money and finances. Listen closely to what Jesus says about how you manage your money in Luke chapter 16, verse 11. Jesus says, if you have not been trustworthy, if you can't be trusted in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? You know, the Bible clearly states that the way we manage our money directly influences how God blesses us spiritually and materially, both here on earth and in heaven. You know, how we manage our money has eternal implications. In other words, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. And the truth is, you know, I think we pastors are so intimidated about how 
resistant people are about this issue that we don't talk about it nearly as much as we should talk about it because it's such a significant issue. But how you manage your money is a big deal. Fortunately, the Bible gives us good practical counsel on how to manage money wisely. And not only should we know, we should be passing this on to our children and our children's children. And so today we're going to look at primarily some of the counsel that comes from a book in the Bible called Proverbs. Proverbs was written by who? Proverbs was written by who? A guy named Solomon. Solomon was the wealthiest man who ever lived on planet Earth. I mean, he was incredibly rich. He would put Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk, Warren Buffett and Bill Gates and all of them to shame. He had far more money than they would ever even think about having. And the Bible says that Solomon was so rich that he literally ate on solid gold plates. I mean, when he finished dinner, he didn't just have to wash the plates. They had to polish his plates. I mean, he was extravagantly wealthy. Not only was he the wealthiest man who ever lived, the Bible says that especially when it came to money, he was the wisest man who ever lived. Now, he was wise when it came to money, but he wasn't really smart when it came to relationships, <laughs> especially women. But fortunately, he put his principles for financial money management down in this book called Proverbs. And I just encourage you. You know, one of the things that uh, I used to do, I used to read a proverb a day. There's like 31 of them. And uh, you could read a proverb every day and just walk away with a lot of practical counsel. And one of the things he talks about quite often in this book is this issue of money handling. You know, I've been the pastor of Cornerstone for the last 36 years. <laughs> and every year, I didn't, I didn't want to ask you to applaud on that, but I thank you. Uh, every year, I have brought either a message or two or even a small series on finances, how to manage money wisely. And so, what else do you say after 36 years <laughs> of addressing this every year. You know, I'm not going to say a whole lot. Of it. I might share a couple of new illustrations. So basically what I'm sharing today is a refresher course and a review of stuff we've talked about many times over the last 36 years. And so I just want to share some basic biblical principles that you will also be taught in financial peace, which I encourage everyone to go to and encourage your children and your children's children to take this course. So, you know, I'm... I'm I don't make any apology about talking about money again. And if anything, I would apologize for is not talking about it enough. We need this message and we need to put it into practice. So once again, I want to share with you some principles. As a matter of fact, I'm going to share five principles, three today and then the last two next Sunday. Five principles that will keep you out of debtor's prison. So here's a question. When it comes to how you handle finances, whose rules are you following? Are you following the rules of the American culture? Are you following your own emotions? Or are you following counsel and principles that will bring freedom into your life? So let me share with you today three. I think I can get to three in the time that I have. God's principles for staying out of debtor's prison. Number one, really simple. <laughs> Keep good records. This is called the principle of accounting. You know, we need to keep good records. Proverbs chapter 27, beginning with verse 23 in the Living Bible paraphrase, puts those verses this way. He says, riches can do what? Disappear what? 
Anybody here agree with that? Anybody here not agree with that? <laughs> Anybody here not experience that? I mean, it, it, it can disappear fast. So watch your business interest closely. Know the state of your flocks and herds. Now, obviously, when Solomon wrote this several thousand years ago, it was a different kind of economy. Most assets were tied up literally for most people when he wrote this, and even in Jesus' day, in farming and agricultural assets. So God says, know the condition of your flocks and herds. And today he would say, know the condition of your assets. Know how much money you have in the bank. Uh, know your real estate investments. Know where you stand on all of the assets in your life. By the way, just knowing this one thing and then tying it into a will, a good will, will save your children and your children's children who, or whoever you're passing on your inheritance to. You're going to pass it on to somebody. How much of it are you going to pass on one day? How much? 100%. All of it. One day. Somebody else. And your family should not fight and squabble. And I have seen that happen over and over. Good Christian families fighting and squabbling over things because, you know, their parents or the generation before them did not. Plan their assets and where it ought to go. You ought to help make that decision. And um, it ought to be stated in your will. That's, that's just free, okay? Keep good records. This is the starting point for good financial management. I mean, how many of you have heard this statement? Money talks. You heard that? Well, the truth is money doesn't talk at all. It just quietly slips away. And it doesn't tell you where it's going. In fact, have you ever said something like this? You know, it's at the end of the month, and I just don't know where it all goes. I don't know where it all went. You know, if you don't know where it all goes, it means you're violating principle number one. You're not keeping good records. That's part of your responsibility as a Christian. If you don't know where your money goes, you're headed for debt. Some of you are deep in debt, and you don't even know it. If, if you're in the dark about how much money you make, and you're in the dark about where it all goes, you are setting yourself up for failure. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 23 says, Get the facts. And I can't think where it's... More important than financially, get the facts at any price. You know, facts are stubborn things, aren't they? You know, facts let you know how you are really doing, where you are really at. If you're married, how are you doing as a family, as a couple? If you're single, how are you doing individually as a single person? A good manager knows where his money is, where it comes from. He knows his assets and he knows where it's going. And there are four things that you need to keep good records on. Here they are, very simply. You need to keep records on what you own. Number two, what you owe. That will determine your net worth. Number three, what you earn. And number four, where it all goes. Let me do that again. You need to keep records on what you own, what you owe, what you earn, and where it all goes, where you spend it. You know, let me give you a, a, a simple equation. Ignorance plus easy credit equals debtor's prison, <laughs> equals financial disaster. If you have credit cards and you're not keeping good records, most likely you're already in debt. And you're probably headed for deeper and deeper debt. You need to keep good records. You need to know where we're at. You need to shine a light on all the financial details of what God's trusted you with. All of your money. Especially if you're a married couple. 
I mean, you need to know two things. You need to know how much you're making and you need to know where it's going. And, and you need to do some assessment and shine some light on your finances and just be honest. Uh, the first step to financial freedom is to keep good records. Write it down. Keep a log. Be accurate. By the way, there's a lot of software that can help you do that if you're into software. Uh, some of us old people aren't into software. If you're not into software, my, by the way, when you sign up for Financial Peace, they give you an incredible software package to help you manage money as part of that, the free thing that's included in that. But get you a notebook. Keep, go, to the, go to the Staples or, or some other, even Walmart, and they'll even have financial books that'll help you tally where you're at and where it's going. But write it down. You say, well, Pastor, I, you know, that, that's so boring, and I could not agree. But there's nothing in my opinion that is reason. I know God did not call me to be an accountant. I would be committing suicide if I had to be an accountant. You know, there's nothing less interesting to me than keeping financial records. Thank God my wife is so much better at it than I am. But if you keep good records, you will have a lot less to worry about. Know where you're going. The Bible says, know the state of your finances. Know the state of your flocks and your herds. Keep good records. Get it? That's 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 good preaching, whether you like it or not. It's right out of God's word. Number two, not should you keep good records, but number two, you need to plan your spending. Plan your, this is the principle of budgeting. A budget is simply a spending plan. It's you telling where you want your money to go rather than you wondering where it went. You know, a good budget makes you a financial manager. You need to plan your spending. A maintained budget allows you to set spending goals, saving goals, and giving goals. Don't just go through life year after year drifting and wondering and doubting and guessing where your money went. You need to plan your spending. Proverbs 21 verse 5. Could we all read that together out loud? You ready? Proverbs 21.5 says, Plan carefully, and you will have plenty. If you act too quickly, you will never have enough. Now, what is this verse saying? It's saying financial freedom is not determined by how much you make. It isn't. Financial freedom is determined by how much you spend. You see, this is one of the biggest myths in society. Society says to us, if you could just make a little bit more, you would be financially free. And the point is, if you can't live on what you're making now, most likely you wouldn't be able to do that if you made a little bit more. Matter of fact, for most of you, you would be a little bit more in debt. You know, why is that? Because our yearnings always exceeds our earnings. <laughs> I mean, you're always going to want more than you make. It's just part of the old sinful nature that we have. Financial freedom is not based on how much you make. It's based on how much you spend. Financial freedom does not come from making more. Financial freedom comes from spending less. No matter how much you make, you can be financially free. All you have to do is bring your spending in line with your income. If you spend less than you make, you don't have to make more. But you got to plan that. You have to plan your spending. And one of the areas that we don't do enough planning on is in the area of shopping. I read this week that the average American spends an average of six to eight hours every week in shopping-related activities. And I know for some of you that is a really low number because some of you spend far too much time now online. Online shopping, the shoppers, 
network, or, well, you know, the, the shopping club. I mean, you don't even have to leave your home anymore to do all of your shopping. I mean, they just bring it right to our house. And some of you, you ought to give your UPS man a tip because he's just making a lot of calls to some of your homes, like mine. You know, what's also interesting is the more educated, according to this study, the more educated you are, you tend to spend less time outside the walls of your house shopping. You tend to spend more time shopping online. And the problem with shopping online is it's the same problem. We end up spending things too quickly. Look at the last half of that verse we just read. Proverbs 21.5, the last part of that verse says, If you act too quickly, you will never have enough. Do you know why I think that's talking about one of the big problems that most of us struggle with? We certainly all struggle with it at one time or another called impulse spending. Have you ever gone shopping and you just saw something really cute? And you just bought it on impulse. You didn't need it. It wasn't part of your budget. You didn't even know it existed. But you saw it and you just had to have it. You looked at it. You made an impulse decision. And you acted quickly. Impulse buying is based on emotions. You didn't say, wow, is this in my budget? <laughs> you didn't think that. You just said, wow, I need this. Now, True confession time. How many of you would admit that at least once in your life you have bought something impulsively and you regretted it later? How it would? And the rest of you will pray for you because we know you're not being honest. You know, impulse buying is part of the American culture, isn't it? You know, American advertising is built on impulse buying. It, you know, advertisers say to us, you need this. And you need it now. Wait, and it may be gone. And by the way, if you'll buy one today, we'll give you another with just a little extra shipping charge. You know, have you ever seen an ad in America that said something like this? Here is a really good product. It will improve your life. But you need to think about this before you buy it. You really need this, but we suggest that you go home and check your budget, and when you know you've got enough cash, come back and purchase it. <laughs> that's how we all have, but that's not the way impulse advertising operates, is it? They say, you need this now, get it now, get it today, you've got to have it, it's sizzling, it, it, it's sexy, it's cool, it's hip, you need to hop to it and get it now. And we buy it, don't we? Wow. How did I ever live without that? I didn't even know it existed five minutes ago. But now I can't live without it. You know, all advertising is built on getting you to do exactly what the Bible says don't do. Don't buy things impulsively. Impulse buying almost always leads to debt. Of course, advertisers have studied our behavior. You know, they know the trigger words that spark our emotions. <laughs> you know, all advertising is built on getting you to do what the Bible says don't do. And they have some one word especially that is almost irresistible. It's called Sale. It's on sale today. I mean, you'll, it'll never be this price again. And so we justify our spending by saying, look how much I'm saving. What we ought to be saying is, look how much I'm spending. <laughs> and the Bible says, don't do that. Don't be an impulsive spender. Plan your spending. Some of us need to put this verse on our computer, or on our windshield, or our refrigerator door, Proverbs 21, 20. Let's all read it together. You ready? This is what the Bible says. The wisest man in the world says what? Stupid people spend their money as fast 
as they get it. <laughs> well, you know, this verse, I believe, is God's IQ test. And so how smart are we? Are you following God's financial plan for freedom? Are you planning your spending? You know, spending can become an addiction. Do we have any shopaholics here today? <laughs> uh, don't confess. You know, did you know that there are actually support groups for online addictive spending today? <laughs> One's called Debtors Anonymous. The other's called the Shopper Stopper. <laughs> uh, you know, I read about one addictive, one addicted impulse buyer. She kept her credit cards in a bowl of water in the freezer. And when she got an urge to spend, she had to wait for the ice to melt, which gave her time to think about it. And I know what some of you addicts are thinking. Some of you addicts are saying, microwave, baby, microwave. <laughs> You're probably an addict and you don't even know it. So how do you break the habit of impulse spending and overspending? How do you spell relief? You spell it B-U-D-G-E-T. Budget. A budget is a simple plan of telling your money where you want it to go, not wondering where it went. And if you want to control your debt, you've got to nip it in the budget. <laughs> Here's a third thing you need to do. You know, not only do you need to plan your spending, but you need to save for the future. You know, the Bible tells us that it's a mark of wisdom to save for the future. Proverbs 21 verse 20 says, The wise man or woman or couple saves for the future. How wise are you when it comes to saving? Did you know the average family in Japan, we're told, saves about 20% of their annual income? The average family in Europe, I'm told, saves about 18% of their income. Do you know how much... Americans save, we spend 1% more than we earn. <laughs> we aren't doing too well, are we? You know, we, we have this live for today mentality. You know, we're trying to keep up with the Joneses. And, you know, no matter if the Joneses went back bankrupt, we got to keep up with the Joneses. And so many Americans today are saving very little for their future. And isn't it amazing here in the most prosperous the most wealth, one of the most wealthiest countries in the world. And we save very little on the average. Proverbs 13, 11. Proverbs 13, 11 says, Money that comes easily disappears quickly, but money that is gathered little by little will grow. You know, the Bible talks about a little insect in the Bible that we need to learn from. Anybody know what that insect is? I mean, they come and visit my house far too often. They're called what? Ants. And the, and the book of Proverbs says, God designed ants to teach us a lesson about money. What lesson do the ants teach us? Well, Proverbs chapter 6 reminds us that the ants store up food during the summer so that they're ready for the winter. Uh, they save up food when they can so that it's there when they need it. And God is saying something with an ant-sized brain, if, that can, if an ant can figure out that it needs to save, don't you think we ought to be able to figure that out? Matter of fact, I'm just gonna, this is not on the print, it's not on the screen. But let me read to you Proverbs 6.6 6 in the message, which is a, an expanded paraphrase. Listen to what it says. He says, you lazy fool. <laughs> Look at the ant. Watch it closely. Let it teach you a thing or two. Nobody has to tell it what to do. 
but all summer it stores up food. At harvest it stocks piles provisions. So how long are you going to laze around doing nothing? How long before you get out of bed? A nap here, a nap there, a day off, a day off there. Sit back, take it easy. Do you know what comes next? Just this. You can look forward to a dirt poor life, poverty, your permanent house guest. <laughs> you know, what the Bible teaches us is that saving for the unexpected and saving for the future is important. It doesn't say hoard. There's a difference between saving purposely, purposely and hoarding. And the Bible doesn't teach hoarding. It does teach saving. And I know most all of us would say, you know, I know I need to save for the future, but why do Americans not do it? You know, American Demographics Magazine says that most baby boomers that are now retiring, most of them will retire with practically little to no savings. You know, we baby boomers <laughs> aren't doing a very good job when it comes to saving for the future. You know, and the problem is our heart. It's not that we don't make enough money. It's our heart. For example, one of the problems we have is envy. Envy is a heart issue. One of the big problems that gets a lot of us into unnecessary spending is comparisons. You know, we look around and we see what other people have and we say, well, you know, if they have that, then I ought to have it. I certainly deserve that. You know, and so we start trying to get stuff that the Joneses have, even if we can't afford it. And if we can't afford it, we go and finance it. We charge it. You know, envy says enough is not enough. And the truth is most of those people that are struggling with, that we're looking at, we're jealous of, most of the people that we look at that we're envious of, most of them are probably in bigger debt than you are. Here's another thing, another truth. The more you have, the more it costs. <laughs> you know, it costs more insurance. It costs more to maintain it. And it's amazing. We, we have one of the most phenomenal things here in St. Cloud that's all over the world. We have places to store our junk. We have so much junk we, our garages are full, so we have to go and rent space to store our junk, and it stays there so long we don't even know what we've stored. <laughs> Friends, that isn't the way God wants us to live. God wants us to be financially free. And friends, I just encourage you, take financial peace. Even if you're a fairly good manager, take it anyway. It will teach you a lot of good principles that are not just for you that you can help pass on to the next generation. This opportunity is so significant, so good, so important that we decided as a staff to take money out of our budget and purchase a group opportunity that Ramsey's organization was offering churches. And we purchased a group plan that we could offer and that we're offering now. What normally cost you $100 to just access the videos, to access all the materials and the assets, and to get the software that comes with this package would normally cost you over $100. But we, want, we bought into this group plan because we felt it was so important that we want to offer it to you as a free gift. All you got to do is sign up for it. You can do it at home. We felt, I felt it was so important that I said, I want this taught on Sunday morning. When people are here, when they have the most time, when most people could actually show up, let's teach this on Sunday morning. We can do it any other night of the week. But I'd like for us to take Sunday morning. And so next, starting next Sunday during the second service, we will be offering financial peace classes for the next nine or so weeks right here on campus. And if you're over there being taught and you're learning how to win, and that, that would just be an incredible blessing. So we encourage you. Sign up. Stop by the the desk, get up one of the cards, the QR code shows you how, and if you need any help, they'll answer any question you have, they'll help you access that material. We just want you to walk in financial freedom.
There's so much more you can do for the kingdom of God when you're financially free. It just takes a load off of your heart when you're financially free. And they're going to walk you through practical steps, how to actually take the things I'm talking about today and next week, how to actually make it happen. And it works if you're willing to work it. Get it? Can we just bow our heads together? Let me ask you a question as I close. How many of you today would be honest enough to let me pray for you? How many of you would be honest enough to say, Pastor, you know, my finances aren't really where they ought to be. And I, I'm having some financial stress. In my, I, I don't know what it is. It might be debt. It might be a change of employment, whatever. But you're just saying, Pastor, I'm really having some financial frustration and stress in my life. Would you pray for me? Would you be bold enough? To just lift your hand right now and just say, acknowledge, Pastor, I have some financial stress and I would appreciate your prayers. Would you lift your hand? Amen. Come on. Amen. Be honest. Amen. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. A lot of hands. Anyone else? Heavenly Father, I want to pray for all of these precious folks who we're just bold enough today to lift our hands and say, I'm just, I really have some financial stress in my life. Lord, you don't want us, it's not your plan for us to live under financial stress. God, money ought to be something that brings freedom into our life. But Lord, we need your wisdom. God, I don't know what the needs are in each of these lives, but God, you do. You know every little detail down to the smallest penny. And God, I just pray that you would bring freedom into the hearts and lives of every person here who lifted their hand. And God, whatever steps they need to take, God, I pray you'd give them wisdom to take those steps, knowing that, God, you're going to bless all of us when we step out in faith and obedience. And God, I just pray for direction. I pray for blessing. I pray, God, that whatever the financial issue is, you would set them free. Lord, I pray that you would touch the hearts of our whole church congregation to be a part of financial peace. God, to pass it on to our children, our children's children, to neighbors and to friends. Here's something that our church is offering that could bless and change your life. Maybe someone here would like to start a small group in their home. And God, as they go through it, invite a few friends over, some relatives, some family members. And just as a family, go through these principles and steps together. God could be one of the best gifts they could give someone they love and even themselves. God, I, I pray if there's anyone here today, Lord, that is struggling in their relationship with you, or maybe they don't know you, I pray that right now, God, you would help them to commit their heart and life to you. Help them, Lord, to pray right now in their heart in a minute, God, I give my life, my heart, and everything I have or ever will, I give it to you. Lord, be Lord of my life. Thank you, Lord, for hearing my prayer. In your incredible name I pray. And all of God's people said.